Hello, everybody, and welcome. Today, we're going to have a great podcast. We're going to have Mr. Eric Pratt. He is a Utah policeman, a former sheriff, corrections officer, and he's going to be talking to us today about not only his experiences with a police force in Utah, but also about his experiences in the Latter-day Saint or Mormon Church and how he went from being what he calls a radicalized Mormon to leaving the church altogether. It's going to be an interesting podcast, and you're not going to want to miss a minute. Now, it's going to go into two hours, so we're going to split it up at the end of the first hour, and you can pick up the second hour on this podcast or at this YouTube channel if you're watching it here. All right, then, don't let me forget to remind you that you can support our channel by going to booksinhindsight.com. We have some great t-shirts available, or go to hindsight.com, and you can pick up any of my books. Now, Eric has not put out a book yet, so I can't uh, direct you to booksinhindsight.com to purchase one of his books, but you certainly can go to Books in Hindsight and purchase Deceptions of the Ages, which is basically what we're going to be talking about in this podcast. And when Eric gets his book out, we're going to go ahead and bring him back and we'll put links to everything. So we're looking forward to that. So without any further delay, except to ask you, please hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. Let's go to the phone. And we explore the great books, works, and ideas of the centuries. Now, here's your host, teacher, and author, Matthew Hines. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Books in Hindsight. As I promised you, I have Eric Pratt standing by. Eric is a Utah policeman. He is a former police chief. And we're going to be talking to Eric today about his experiences in the Latter-day Saint or Mormon Church. We're going to be talking about his experiences as a Latter-day Saint missionary. We're going to be talking about his beliefs about uh, certain elements of the church. We're going to be talking about church culture and we're going to be talking about why Eric made the choice to uh, choose to leave the church. And I want to just uh, point out before I bring Eric on that Eric describes himself as a former radical, radical Mormon. So that's going to be exciting to hear about. So welcome, welcome to, to Books in Hindsight, Eric Pratt. Thanks for having me. Now, Eric, I want to get something out of the way, first of all. Uh, you're a you're a police chief now, or you were a police chief? Uh, <clears throat> I served as a small town police chief in Central Utah from 2014 till 2017. Okay, well, I want to make sure I'm using correct protocol. Do I address you as Eric, or do I address you as chief, like in the movie? Uh, uh, just Eric, please. That would okay. be preferable. Okay, well, Eric, it's a great honor to have you on the podcast, and I want to thank you for, you know, protecting the people that you protect and for the sacrifices that you make uh, for the people that you serve. Oh, thank you very much. All right. So with that out of the way, Eric, would you just, um, we're talking about on the podcast, we had, the last podcast we had, we had a spiritualist, and we're kind of theming around uh, faith. And um, one thing that, that is pretty prevalent in society today is the loss of faith. Now, I chose Eric, and uh, I, I hope Eric also chose me for the same reason, because Eric and I both come from the same uh, sort of backgrounds. Now, Eric is, is one of these guys that the, the Latter-day Saint Church wants to have. I mean, he is upstanding. He did a mission, um, and 
You know, he's really a pillar of his community. And, and not that I am not, but I didn't do a mission. Um, I've always, you know, not been the, the perfect uh, Latter-day Saint. And I, I served in the military uh, out of high school and, uh, and I went to college, not at BYU. So I'm just a rebel in the eyes of the church. And I'm probably one of the guys that they wish, you know, maybe we could get Eric in and, and maybe get this Heinz guy uh, to not come so much. But uh, so we're looking at two degrees. Uh, of people who have experienced the Latter-day Saint Church. And Eric, I, I just want to inform our readers as well. I too, I don't know if you were born in Utah, but I was. Um, and we, we migrated to Washington State. So the first thing I want to ask you, um, Eric, to, for our readers' benefit, we're going to be talking about the church and the church's culture. But first of all, we want to talk to you about Eric Pratt, the policeman. Tell us, um, what, what did your duties involve, and, and what kind of environment did you work in? Well, from 2005 until 2008, I worked uh, as a corrections officer at the state of Utah for the prison. And um, during that time, it was mostly um, transporting inmates from the prison to <clears throat> medical centers, to court appearances, to housing changes. So almost all my time at the prison was spent on the road in vehicles, moving inmates around the state, uh, state inmates for those reasons, and then returning them back to their uh, location that they were going to stay at. Um, for, for those three years, <clears throat> more than two of them were doing that. And then I, I ended up working uh, as a patrolman for a small town in central Utah. I uh, got a job just uh, pulling cars over, responding to calls for service, domestics, drunk driving, speeders, that stuff that you see. I did that for about six years. So rounding out my time would have been around nine years, to, um, almost 10 years. I became, uh, I was appointed as the, the police chief for that town. And I served as police chief uh, for, for almost four years, a little more than three years. Uh, in that capacity, I still did a lot of the same patrol work, but I also supervised um, a small group of officers and a pretty good sized group of part-time officers. So uh, that was a lot of personnel maintenance, um, on top of regular duties. Also in that time, I was fortunate enough to get to work as a canine officer and do drug interdiction, um, a little bit on I-70, which was in my jurisdiction. Uh, I was able to get a place on the Sevier County Metro SWAT team. I'd, I'd spent a few years as a SWAT operator. So I was able to get some experience in a couple little things that a lot of small town uh, officers don't usually get to to do the kind of the big city stuff that, you know, has all the divisions and all the, the, the fun things that, you know, you see uh, cops wanting to get into. You, d you don't see that so much in small towns, but I was kind of fortunate to, I, I guess I created, I, I sold the idea to the police department to start a canine program and I found a dog and I got things donated. So I kind of started the first canine program so I could do, do some of those things. And that's just kind of been my experience. Um, after leaving Salina, it was Salina Police Department, which is a really small town in central Utah. I, I ended up getting a job with uh, the Moab City Police Department, which is down in the south, uh, eastern corner of the state. And I worked there for just under a year. Uh, when I left Salina, I was trying to quit law enforcement for good. And I, I made it about eight or nine months before I went back. Uh, there's not a lot of job opportunities outside of <clears throat> law enforcement in central Utah. If, if you're a law enforcement officer and you leave law enforcement and you want a different job, and you live in central Utah, there's just not a lot of opportunity. So uh, this is where my kids are, my family uh, that I've created is. And so I, I, could, I, I didn't feel like I could uh, get too far away. Uh, so after trying to find employment closer to central Utah, I, I eventually had to go back to law enforcement because that's really all I, I knew. I tried, uh, tried that in Moab. Being away from the kids as, as much as I, I was was too hard. And so I eventually quit that too, and uh, I'm I'm trying again to transition out of the out of the career of law enforcement. Not not because it's not a, a respectable career, and it's not that I don't respect the work that law enforcement does, but uh, at some point in my life, it just my heart I fell out of love with it. If that makes sense. Right. Well, you know, as you get older, you things become more important to you, and you know, in that um, in in that um, area, I mean, it sounds like. You're doing are you doing work on the highway as well because you're you're talking about pulling over speeders and stuff and and in that uh, area you're going to get a lot of of different traffic of you know especially 
you know, like south of the border traffic. So was that one of the inspirations for you wanting to go for the canine? Well, yeah. So Salina is a small town, but two miles of Interstate 70 go through that jurisdiction. And so uh, we had the opportunity to go work on the freeway since it was in our jurisdiction and, and pulling over cars on I-70 all day. You do see a lot of drug trafficking. You see a lot of that stuff. And so I don't know that I would have been, in, you know, had the thought, hey, let's, let's start a canine unit if uh, if we didn't have that that traffic coming through on that interstate. Uh Prior to me starting a canine unit, um, there were there was a dog that Highway Patrol had in the area, and there was a dog that Sevier County had in the area. But when both of those dogs uh, went away from the area due to either handlers stopping working canine or transferring, or dogs getting old and getting retired, you know, there was a period of time where we didn't have a dog. So whenever anyone pulled over a car and could use a canine for a, a search, uh, we just didn't have one. And that was the time where I said, "Hey, well, you know, what would stop us from?" as a small department doing it, if I'll, if I'll put in the work and find enough, you know, free resources, you know, I convinced the city council and the mayor and the chief and others that, you know, this would be an asset and it would be cheap enough and we could do it. And, and they, they let me put a proposal together and they let me find the resources. And I did. And so we got a, a, a retired dog from another agency. And even though he, they retired him, we used him for another couple of years. And uh, when he, when I retired him, I, I found another dog and bought him for 200 bucks money out of my own pocket sold him to the city for a dollar and trained him up to do canine to replace the other one. And I did that one for another year or so uh, before I became chief. And I couldn't really do all that I needed to do as an administrator and a patrolman and a working chief. And also canine just takes an immense amount of time for dog training and, and to keep up on, on things you need to keep up on. So I had to give up something. And unfortunately that's when I ha- had to give up canine. So. Okay. So um, I just want to ask this. So you're basically, when you're on the highway, this is not here or there, but um, like you're, you're pulling people over, but the revenue that you uh, produce, that, that goes to your jurisdiction, right? That goes to your precincts, your... Uh, depending on, this, on the violation. So the state of Utah takes uh, a, per, a percentage of, uh, of revenue from, from citations. And so speeding... What the state tries to do is, if it's a if it's a more of a local issue, they try to allocate more of the fine uh, monies to that local jurisdiction. So if you have speeding tickets, I think it's something like or it was around eighty percent of that would go to your jurisdiction's revenue. Um, and it doesn't go to your police department; it goes to your city. So your justice court would collect that, and then it's, it goes into a general fund and it's allocated to the city through uh, decisions city council members and mayors make. But for example, if I arrested or charged someone with drug possession that's more of a state, interstate, international type problem. And so those funds, 80% of those funds would end up back in the, with the state of Utah. And so it just depended on the offense. And, and that's the state is in control of those decisions. And they work with their municipalities and they argue about who gets what money. And, and it probably changed, has probably changed since then. It may not be the same now, but that, yeah, some of the money goes to the state. Some of it goes to your jurisdiction. Yeah. So Eric, I just have to, this is my last question towards this this line, but um, it would seem to me that uh, you're on this, this major artery for all kinds of drugs, contraband and whatever. And you would think that there would be a stronger emphasis on, you know, interdiction in that area. And it sounds like people are just, well, we're kind of hands off and, and then we get a super cop like you and, and yeah, no, we need to, we need to go in and check these people out. So um, what, why, why was there no motivation to, you know, to, to search these vehicles or to see what's coming through? I think the state of Utah, they have their own uh, canine, they have their own interdiction team, and they, they usually hang, up in, hang out up in Salt Lake on I-80. Uh, but they do travel throughout the state and hit major highways. Uh, I, they were, I saw them down here this last week, I saw a, a, just a bunch of Utah Highway Patrol SUVs with canine all over them, and I knew the interdiction team was on I-70. And, and they spend a week, and then they'll go back up to Salt Lake and hit I-80. There's just way more traffic on I-80. There's just way more people. And, you know, you got to go where the people are. But as far as local emphasis on this, I mean, if you look at the way sheriff's departments are run, depending on who the sheriff is, there's sometimes it's more of a – it's almost like in between elections, it's a pretty much a four-year campaign process – of not looking like you're spending taxpayer money for frivol- frivolities that don't really seem to affect your area, for example. So, if, for example, if someone's driving through 
Sevier County or Salina and they have, you know, 10 pounds of meth, the chances are that 10 pounds of meth is just driving through. Chances are that it's not going to be delivered to our community. And so there are those that would argue, why are we doing a ton of, you know, putting a ton of resources into something that's really going to be the problem of Chicago or New York or, you know, and they have the resources and the money and the units, the specialized units and the DEA and everyone else to do that. So why don't we focus on our local communities? And there's an argument to be made for that. But the other side of that is that after drugs hit a major hub, they're parsed out into smaller portions and then even smaller portions and they make their way through dealers and eventually ounces do make their way back into our communities here. So you can nip ounces here or you can uh, nip pounds on the interstate. But either way, you, 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 I think if all law enforcement collectively works on that, you're going to make a bigger impact. Now, uh, my personal opinion on, on drugs and, and, and those things is, is different. But as, as a law enforcement officer, when I'm working, it doesn't really matter what my personal opinion is. Uh, I just have a job that I have to do and I have the laws that are made not by me, but not by other cops, by the legislature. And my, the, by definition, I would be a law enforcement officer. And so there's a lot of laws that I think need to be changed or fixed or worked on or, or should go away or new ones that should be made. But I'm sure you have your opinions and everyone else does. And my job is just to in, enforce the ones we do have the way that they are intended, and whether I agree with them or not. So, Right. So uh, now I ha- you just pushed us right into this question. But me living in Washington State where uh, pot is legal, and I, I, I have a... I've got a few friends, like I'm from Utah. So um, a friend of mine told me that you guys actually passed the medicinal marijuana and she voted for it. I I couldn't, you know, she's very big in the church and she said, oh, I voted for it. So um, so at least as far as I see it is that when you legalize pot, you put a lot of people that shouldn't be in business out of business. Do you agree with that or is that is that too much? If you do it right. Now, the way Utah has done it so far, it has to be in blister packs and it has to be uh, in like almost a pill form. So it's a long cry from, you know, I've pulled someone over and they've got a pipe and a, a eighth of an ounce in a baggie or something. You know, it's not it's not like other states. It's it's incrementally inching closer that way. And it will eventually, I think, go that way. Um, marijuana, I think it's not surprising that your friend feels that way. I would have probably voted the same way. At the same time, I would have had to charge somebody with something like possession of marijuana uh, and not charge somebody for possession of uh, an alcohol beverage because that's legal. And we can argue about which one's more, uh, which one's a bigger bane on, on society. And there's probably an argument to be made for both being bad in their own way or bad differently or good differently. Um, you know, one's legal, and one's not. And who made the law? Uh, probably people that enjoy alcohol and probably think that marijuana is not for them. And if you put people in charge of a state who think marijuana is for them and alcohol is bad, you'll see the laws will change to reflect that. And it's, it's, it's a bit arbitrary what we decide as a society sometimes is ethical and moral. Uh, and when you really get down to brass tacks and think, why did we make this decision? And there was a time alcohol was illegal in all 50 states or at the time, however many states we had, 48 or 49. Well, Eric, are you familiar with why and how uh, marijuana came to be uh, illegal in the first place? Because this kind of touches on what we're talking about anyway. You know how it uh, I, I'm sure I've heard. I'm sure you're going to ring a bell in my head, but go for it. Well, I heard about this when I was in uh, high school. You know, we have to go to seminary. And our seminary teacher, and for people who don't know, uh, Latter-day Saint Mormon kids have to go to class before they go to school in the morning. And our um, teacher was telling us how bad uh, pot is and how um, Latter-day Saint uh, missionaries were coming back from Mexico and saying, oh, no, it's good. They're saying there's nothing wrong with it because it's in the word of wisdom. It's the fruit of the field or the herb of the earth or or whatever. And so the, the head of the church... And at the same time, um, you had Weyerhaeuser and um, Georgia Pacific that had purchased all this forest land, and they did not want to compete with hemp. Um, And so that was reefer madness time. And anyway, so with those two uh, groups, the the Latter-day Saints, and I think, um, I can't remember who the Secretary of Agriculture was. I want to say Benson, but it's probably not the right time period. But they were successful, and they got it um, classified as a as a felony 
a drug, I think. And anyway, but it was actually because of the um, LDS church had a had a big part in that because the missionaries were coming back from Mexico saying "Viva," you know. So I'm, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. So, Okay. Well, well, that was one, uh, another tangent I, I didn't want to get uh, too far off of. Um, but I want to ask you this because I want to transfer over into our discussion about um, the church. And as a, as a law enforcement officer, I imagine you, you, you did also, you know, patrol a community and, and probably, you know, a, a high percentage of Latter-day Saints did you see the same kind of problems you would see in any other, you know, community? Um, I saw the same problems you'd see in any other Utah community, I think. Um, yeah, high percentage of Mormons. Along with that comes a high percentage of pornography and a high percentage of uh, opioid addiction. And that is something that's quite unique to to Utah specifically and, and our culture. And, and more, direct, you know, more uh, precisely the Provo, Utah area. Um, I think there's been studies that have shown that you know, I mean, not to go off on another tangent, but those, those two are big. Uh, they are, they do relate. They do relate to, to law enforcement and crime. I saw a lot of, um, unfortunately, I did see a lot of cases of incestuous behavior amongst juveniles where young kids were, I mean, not too young. I mean, you know, prepubescent tweens or whatever, uh, committing sexual acts against other siblings who are younger. And then upon further investigation, you find out where these kids got these ideas. And so many, so much of the time it was because they were exposed to pornography at a young age. It was kind of what, where it took hold, or maybe they were abused by somebody at a younger age. And then um, as they get into their preteen ages and they start, you know, hitting puberty, they don't quite know what to do with whatever chemicals are starting to be produced. And, and they direct their, their, uh, I guess their proclivities towards whoever's nearest. And so I, I, I took a, quite a few cases of uh, sexual assault, um, a lot of just young people committing sexual assault, but probably the bread and butter uh, was just mostly domestic uh, problems, uh, I would say, and, and alcohol, alcohol, domestics, and, and drugs. Yeah, but th- that's common throughout, I guess, everywhere. Uh, I, think, I think Utah might have a more pronounced issue with pills, and pornography, which is not illegal, but the the fruit of, of pornography abuse does manifest in in crimes we do have on the books. Wow, you know it's so funny you mentioned those two things because uh, I had a this friend of mine who I was uh, talking to you about. She's she's big in the church. She's actually she's got recommendations from Colin Powell, and she's known worldwide. and And um, she was uh, we did an interview, um, one of my first interviews. And she was telling me, because we haven't talked for a long time, I spent a lot of uh, time in the Middle East, and she's telling me about how Utah has all these people addicted to opioids. Yeah. I'm going, Utah? And yeah. but then you, when we'll talk about this, but then you start thinking, well, it, the word of wisdom doesn't say anything about opioids, does it? So, And they're prescribed by a professional. So, yeah, you can get a lot of drugs prescribed by a professional. They're not, not 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 limited to opioids. As long as they come through a valid prescription to your doctor, your priesthood authority generally accepts that you are obeying the word of wisdom. Whether whether you're abusing it or not is, I guess, up to you to to, to decide amongst your priesthood authority. Um, but if you simply say, "Hey, I'd like my temple recommend," but I also have a prescription for Percocet or Lortabs or what you know, even stronger things now. Uh, fentanyl and stuff like that you know your, your priesthood authority is going to let you get your temple recommend and you can go home and abuse it when out of sight and and it happens that happens every in every corner of every neighborhood in this state you know and in many other places oh heroin uh opioid based uh you know nar- when we're talking about narcotic analgesics or uh, central nervous system depressants uh there we're primarily primarily talking about heroin or synthetic heroines opioids pill forms, uh, that kind of stuff is, is very, very, very addicting and, and more frightening than other drugs. You can overdose on it very easily. It's, it's something that when you take enough of it, your heart slows until it stops or your breathing slows until you, it stops. A lot of other drugs you, you overdose on, um, it's not generally going to be considered a lethal affair. It may be a medical emergency and sometimes lethal, but usually when it's lethal, it's because it's, 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 it's along with, it's comorbid with like another medical condition that you're having. So 
if you already have a heart problem and you're doing a lot of meth and you get tasered, you might die. But um, generally, you can just smoke a lot of meth as much as you know, as much as you can get high on, is, and you don't usually die from it. Heroin just it's a scary drug. There's a lot of young people dying. I, I had a close friend. I didn't see him since high school. I was driving on uh, I-15 in Salt Lake a couple years ago, and I was thinking, you know, you know, just my look up at a billboard. And there's a billboard size picture of my friend from high school's face. And it was uh, linked with uh, a website to do with uh, getting, uh, I guess, agencies to start carrying Narcan because I guess he could have been saying, I didn't know he died. He died uh, with a needle in his arm in in his bathroom. He was not a drug abuser when I knew him. Very good guy. Thought about him a lot. Sometimes I thought about hitting him up on Facebook or something and, and seeing what he's up to. I, the next time I saw him, he was on a billboard for heroin overdose. You know, and he's not. He didn't grow up in a in a drug abuse type family. He grew up in a regular Utah household, and where you you start with a pill, and it's given to you by your doctor. Your doctor starts to say, "Hey, you know, you, you broke your your leg a long time ago. I think we should cut back on this prescription." But you know, you're hooked, and so when you can go get heroin a lot cheaper. It's a lot better high and it lasts a lot longer, you know, and you're addicted. Oh, well, this is how we're turning regular people into heroin addicts that didn't grow up in, in these types of atmospheres, drug atmospheres, you know, broken home. Like they didn't grow up in, your, in, in what you would think of as, well, it makes sense they're a drug abuser. Look how they grew up. It doesn't make sense. It makes sense because they got hooked on pills. That's why, you know, it's all over Utah. Yeah, and you know that's something that I uh, I went over to the Middle East uh, right after September 11th. I was teaching, and I didn't see any of this. And um, I've I've seen this. I I know somebody that I think took pills and then drank and then died. And people thought, oh, it was a suicide. But yeah, I don't, I, I think she just uh, didn't remember how many pills she'd taken. And um, yeah, so. Uh, and that, that's pretty scary. And then, you know, I don't even want to get into, cause like I have, I have like this conspiracy mind, I guess. And then you think about how we went over and took over the opium trade and, Oh, look, it's here now. So that's just, that's great. So, yeah. And I don't, I don't understand the mentality of, you know, this is going to, if you do this, it's going to change your life. Like, you know, I, I was in the military and I had the opportunity to do everything. And I said, really, you know, you do that and you're never going to have control over your life again. So why, why would you even start that? And uh, yeah, it just, it makes no sense to me. And um, I wonder if somebody somewhere is saying, well, Darwinism, Darwinism at work here. And um, I don't know. I, I don't know what the answer is. And, and I feel sorry uh, about your friend and, you know, the people that, that are affected by this. But uh, where's the education? So, all right, Eric, well, did, before we go into talking about the church, does, did any of this have anything to do with you being disillusioned with police work? Um, I think I got disillusioned. There, there was multi, there's like a multifaceted reason. Re, there are many reasons that I simultaneously kind of took hold. And, I mean, without going into too much detail on any of them for the sake of time, I as I got older and started to kind of get a better idea of how, especially when after, you know, it was more and more and more when I became a police chief and I started getting more involved, involved in the actual local government as a patrolman, you just take your orders and go to your thing. As a police chief, you actually have to interact with council and mayor and citizens and take complaints. And you have to start wondering, uh, you know, when you get a complaint, what's the right thing to do if an officer did this or an officer did that and you have to refer to policy and you have to wonder, well, who makes policy and why was policy made? And, you know, what, all the all the things start kind of clicking together and you start i think it, it leads to it led me to a place of questioning more and when you're you know like you know as a military as a military man you know, especially when you when you first enter you know you get your orders and you go do your thing you're not part of the planning you're not part of the reason why your your job is to go do what you're told and and if everyone does what they're told you know and you have the right people making the plans hopefully you'll be successful you know too many chefs in the kitchen you know you don't want that so when I started doing more administrative uh, duties, um, and I started, you know, I started going to uh, meetings with other heads of departments, and we were starting to figure out what the legislature, you know, we, I'd get involved with what, what is the legislature doing? How will this affect my department? How will this affect my, my officers and, and my community? 
I didn't yeah, have to think about that before. And, and so when the curtain got lifted and I got to kind of see the wheels, how everything's going, how, how, what, why things are the way they are, I started to realize, well, no one, no one really has all the answers. You know, we're all kind of clueless. We're all just, we're all kind of equal in a weird way. And there's certain people that make the rules. And, and I guess as citizens, we should vote the people in that, that will make the rules that represent how we feel. But the people we put in place, they're not, they're just like us. And so, you start to have to do critical thinking because I think there's a time in every man's life when he kind of gets to know who he is and he has to think critically. And so when you said before, you know, conspiracy, I mean, I'm, I'm a conspiracy guy too, when it comes to critical thinking, you know, if, if, if I have to think critically about something, sometimes a conspiracy is the most, the best, simplest and most logical answer sometimes. So long story short, at the same time, I started to just kind of think, wow, I mean, why is this law this way? Because if I go enforce that law, I'm going to have this impact on this person's life. And it is my job to do it. And, and is there another way I can enforce this law in a way that's lesser or more appropriate? Or is there another way I can enforce this law that's more severe or more appropriate for this situation? And, and thankfully, a lot of that isn't up to the police officers because we should, I don't know, you know, it should be in the hands of judges. I think they should be able to use their indeterminate sentencing and their other guidelines to, to go try to fix and help problems and cops were kind of just the funnel. We just funnel people to court or we funnel people away from, you know, wherever they need to go. But uh, I, I don't mean to keep going on, but to, to try to keep it brief. I started to question, um, am I glorified? Some days I felt like a glorified tax collector for the state. And, you know, I grew up in a very poor family. I grew up with parents who couldn't always register their car on time. And then, and two or three months out, I, I you know, now in Utah, if you, have your car has expired three months, then you're subjecting yourself to the possibility and very like actually the real likelihood that if you get pulled over, your car will be impounded. And then you'll be paying a state impound tax fee. You'll be paying the tow fee, the storage fee. You'll pay the, the fine for the citation and you'll have to get it registered before you can get it out. Now, how did that help a poor person to get their car registered? I guess it ultimately got their car registered, I guess. But did that help the poor person financially? Is there, is there, a, is there another way. I mean, I used to pull people over for no insurance and I, my, I was supposed to impound their vehicle. And and if, again, if I don't impound their vehicle and I let them drive down the street and they run into you or me and it's their fault, you know, am I helping the person that got T-boned at the next intersection because I didn't impound a car and now they're injured and the guy didn't have insurance? No, I can't let him go. But if he doesn't have insurance because it's a financial reason, how is a $400 ticket and an impound going to help? So I, I quite often, I, I'd find my own loopholes, perfectly legal and I think very just loopholes. I would tell, for example, I'd tell the person, hey, you know, the stop's going to take me about 15 to 17 minutes, which is how long, you know, it, without the impound, just to do a traffic stop. They've decided in federal courts that you, you have about 15, 17 minutes of, of regular work if, the, if nothing else arises. And so, yeah, I've got 15, 17 minutes. If, if you could call an insurance company and get insurance over the phone and use your card and get it right now. I mean, most people can do that for under $100. And, and, and if you can show me proof of it and I can confirm it before the stop is over, I won't submit the citation and I won't impound your car and you can drive away. Everything's covered. The guy has insurance. It costs him less than 100 bucks. There was no impound. The state and the city didn't get their money. That's true. But who, who do I work for? I get, I get paid by the state and the city, but who, who does the state and the city work for? Us, the people that I pull over, the people I, whose houses I go to. Whose team am I on? Should there be an us versus them? And so those kinds of questions have started keeping me awake at night as I do things I had to do for my job and impacted people. I'm not saying police are not necessary, and I'm not saying they're not amazing people. But man, it just suits some people better than others. And, and it, it took me 13 years of doing it to realize yeah, I mean, I can do it. I don't feel good. I don't like it. Do you know what I mean? I'm glad someone's doing it and I respect them. I, I can't, I just can't keep doing it. And it doesn't pay enough for that kind of stress either. It really doesn't pay me two or three times what I'm making. And I may still not want to do it. It's just it, 90% of the time you're, 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 you're not doing anything super dangerous, you know, maybe more, but that one or, I'm you know, I was just saying that the, the times you actually earn your pay, you, you couldn't find enough people, enough money. The times that cops earn their money when they're actually putting themselves in harm's way for real, I mean, you couldn't pay most people any amount of money to do it in that moment. Who, who would do it and why? What good is your money if you're dead? And cops do it for pretty low wages, really, in this state. Yeah, and Eric, you just, you just hit on why I am not, and I've never considered 
uh, ever ever being a policeman because you know I, I see that that they you have and I, it's so nice to hear what you're saying about how you help people out because you're right I mean I grew up poor also and you know not in the situation that you're talking about but you know when there's no money there's no money and then tacking on all these fines and if you go to court um, like for anything you don't see people in suits in the court they're all poor. You know, yeah. and so it, it's it seems to me and having seen people that have been uh, put into the system, um, the, the law is not there to help anybody out or to fix their problem or whatever. It's it's to put them into a system of peonage where they're always indebted to the state and, and everything that they do has to be, you know, has to be controlled by the state. And and, and it's not educated people. It's not wealthy people. And, and who's doing this to uh, who them, to us, is the wealthy, you know? It's lawyers that, that make all this money. And then the, the next thing I want to point out is that, you know, for, for policemen, I, I've never been one, but I, I think that there is a, there's kind of what you call a de, <clears throat> excuse me, a desensitivity. Um, excuse me. Excuse <clears throat> me. When you're working in a small community, you know the people. I mean, you know most of the people that you're interacting with, and you know how your decisions will affect their life. But if you're working in a big community and people are, you know, basically taking pot shots at you, you get a very um, skeptical view of your job, the people you're wor- you're serving, and you know. And as as you go into like cities like Seattle, Los Angeles, I mean, I have friends that are cops here, and um, they have such a horrible outlook on humanity. Um, it's, it's not funny. And, and um, anyway, um, I'm just glad, Eric, to, to hear you say that you um, took people's uh, situation into, uh, into um, you know, context, because especially today, if you don't have any money, you don't have any money. So it's nice to hear that. So can we um, talk, uh, let's, let's shift where we've been talking so long about this other stuff, which is absolutely fascinating, fascinating, but let's kind of transition. How did your, uh, your uh, faith, um, how did that affect your duties? I mean, obviously we've seen that you, you take into consideration the people's lives who you're affecting, but how else did your faith affect uh, how you did your job? Well, I remember, you know, like, for example, the first few suicides or fatal car accidents I went on. And, and, and I think religion has, has long been and maybe could have been conceived in the need for humans to cope with the idea of death. And, and so, um, you know, it wasn't really any different for me. I was young and I was I wasn't by my mid twenties, I wasn't practicing, but I was still a believer. I, I had a lot of issues. Most of the issues I had with Mormonism arose during my mission for me. And I wasn't prepared to leave Mormonism. I was just kind of like, well, there's a lot for me to figure out. There's a lot to learn. There's stuff I must not understand. There's questions I have, but surely, you know, the church is correct. And I just need a break. You know, that after growing up as, as, as rigorously Mormon as I did, and then spending two years on a mission, and essentially every day of your life on a mission is like all day church. It's like, you know, except for six hours on Monday, you get to play some basketball, write a letter, and do some laundry. But if you're awake, it's like being in church. You're dressed like you're going to church. You're talking about church. You're trying to get other people to be a member of your church. You're going to meet with other members who are members of your church, and you're sustaining each other in each other's beliefs. You're practicing social, uh, you're, or, you know, you're, you're, you're basically at church for two years. And so what, basically when I was done with that two-year mission, I, I really just felt like I needed a break from Mormonism, from church, from religion. I didn't think it wasn't necessarily true. There were times on my mission where I became convinced for a month at a time or so, or weeks at a time that maybe it wasn't because, you know, you learn a lot on your mission when you get out in the world that your parents don't tell you at home. There's a lot of pe- people approach you with problems with your religion that you didn't hear. In, the, in, your, in your little community or with your people around you. You know, there's a reason why I was a kid. If I want to go hang out with someone from school and my parents would ask if they're a member of the church or they'd already know if they were in our neighborhood, for example, if they were at church, oh, you can't go hang out there because they're not a member of the church. And so where were my opportunities to hear any opposition to the church teachings? Well, my first real opportunities to hear opposition came when I was a, a missionary outside of the country. 
And I was approached by people who brought up stuff I'd never heard. And as I studied and tried to verify if it was true or not, I was like, got scared. Like, whoa, this seems like it could be true that they're what they're telling me. So my initial problems for the, with me in the church really started as I went through the temple and then went on my mission. The temple kind of freaked me out and then the mission didn't help. Got home, needed a break, but I was not, I would defend the church. I would defend the church to anybody. I may not go. I, I mean, I was, a lot of time I was paying my tithing and doing the things other than going to church. And, and really, I think the biggest reason I really quit going to church is because I became a cop. And when I would go to church, I was sitting amongst the people that I was dealing with all day. And instead of going to church and feeling edified or feeling like I was learning something or, or, or you know, it, it turned into a thing where people would turn to me and, and they'd want to talk to me about their nephew who I pulled over and arrested for DUI the other day. And how's his case and what's going on with that? Or Oh, you know, Officer Pratt, I filed that, that report two weeks ago and I haven't heard back from the department. It wasn't you that took the, kit, the call, but can you speak with the other officer and find out where this is at? And church became almost like an extension of work. And so every, in between every, I mean, every single opportunity that wasn't taken up by us sitting and listening to someone talk, people were basically accosting me in the aisle and in the parking lot and everywhere I went about their problems. Oh, my neighbor's sprinkler is hitting my fence. It's rotting the wood. What can I do about it? I mean, just the most... How can you get rest? How can you get rest from that kind of a job? Yeah, I was already working 50 hours a week before I was chief. And then I was chief, I was working 70 plus and, and uh, I was on call for, you know, anywhere between 10 or 20 hours a week or more, depending on the week or who's out of town. And, you know, if you're home, I was always on the phone with about work, you know, you go to church. And I think that's one reason I really quit actually being present and going to church is because I felt like an extension of work in a small community, I felt like I couldn't get away. So that's that's the beginnings. Okay, that's uh, you should have been, you should have grown up in a, or, or or you should have went to work in Washington because when I was growing up, we had a, you know we had policemen in our ward and um, it was all oh, he's a cop, <laughs> so, so nobody wanted to, to associate with him. But but no, I, you know I, I'm just kidding. But yeah, that's a that's a kind of a different culture. And and when we started talking about this, you did say that yeah, it was it's typical. Utah, Utah culture, but um, yeah. Um, so, what um, I, I can understand because um, because I think when you get into these small towns, I mean these aren't Harvard graduates, and and they're very simple, salt of the earth uh, people, and and they seek uh, simple solutions and and whatever. So it probably is a, a pretty different um, culture. So, Eric, I have to know you talked about people told you something in Europe that made you, you know, question everything. Um, I've heard everything. Can, would you tell us, does it, does it matter? Or would you like to talk about the things that you learned that you didn't know before? Well, I think if you're a Mormon or if you're LDS, uh, and I do try to show respect uh, when I use, when I, I have, I'm going through my own transition. You know, I, when I left the church, I actually uh, spoke in a way and used words that were true, but probably offensive uh, to members and and i'm i'm trying to use words and and i'm trying to relate to people i'm trying to remember how it felt to be in their shoes because the enemy is not me- they're not members of any church um if you don't like a church or you don't believe a doctrine or you know for a fact that something's a fraud you know why target the victims of a fraud and offend them and hurt their feelings and actually push them away from your position and so I used to use words when I first left the church that were more, I guess, you know, no offense was offered, but offense was taken, you know, and and sometimes you have to watch your words. But uh, I I think for me, the the point where, and I'm sorry if I'm not, what was your original question? I feel myself starting to go off on a tangent and I don't want to do it. What was the original inquiry? Um, Well, I was just wondering why, um, um, you, uh, you, you learned something, somebody told you something in Europe. Oh, yes. And, and uh, I just wanted to know, uh, w- what was it, I guess? It was, um, so as, uh, as I started to say before I went off on the tangent, um, the cornerstone of the Mormon church is the Book of Mormon. And the cornerstone of the Book of Mormon is Joseph Smith. So if Joseph Smith was truly a prophet of God, um, then of course the Book of Mormon would be, you know, true, a true uh, actual scripture. And if that's true, then you know, then everything that follows could could have a solid case. 
Um, Joseph Smith was attacked a lot on my mission. I got, I got information from a lot of sources. They didn't, you know, you can go to a Baptist church or a Catholic church and, and a Mormon church. And we can argue about doctrine, but it, it all centers around Jesus Christ, the resurrection, on and on. Mormons, you know, they have a little extra. That's fine. But what, what got attacked a lot and which shook me was uh, when people would tell me things about Joseph Smith that I didn't know. And, and frankly, I didn't know if it was true what they were telling me. And when I do a little fact checking, I found there was, there was a smoke there. there was, maybe there's a fire. And, you know, as I heard from ministers of other churches, I used to go to other churches on my mission. I used to tell, you know, people who are investigating or for people who don't know what that means, people who are thinking about becoming a Mormon, who are listening to the missionaries. We'd go to their church. They say, "You come to my Seventh Day Adventist church on Sunday, or I guess on Saturday in that case, and um, we'll go to your Mormon church on Sunday." And so we used to do that, and we're like, "Okay, we'll go sit through their their meeting, and 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 then they'll come to ours, and they'll see the the difference, and they'll become Mormons, and we won't. Of course, we're not going to be coming. We're not going to become Seventh Day Adventists." And you know, you go to those churches, then their minister would come, and you're wearing a white tag, and they know who you are, and you're sitting in their flock, and they're wondering why there's wolves in their flock, and so they want to come suss you out, figure out what your intentions are, why you're there, are you really want to become a Seventh-day Adventist, or are you just trying to poach from our flock? And so they'd come and suss you out, and we'd start, you know, our typical arguments over doctrine. And, and I got a lot of information from a lot of pastors who had done their research on Joseph Smith. And one of the things that bothered me the most was information that, you know, he he had married, uh, you know, and I guess there's still, this is still something up for a debate for amongst a lot of people, but the age of some of his wives and how young they were. And, and, just the fact that he had more than one bothers me as a non-Mormon. But at the time as a Mormon, I could get over polygamy. After all, it's found in the Old Testament amongst many Old Testament prophets. Abraham had at least, you know, set four wives, if I recall. Isaac and Jacob all had multiple wives. There's plenty more prophets. And so I could get over that. And I could argue with them that, you know, you can't attack Joseph Smith just for having more than one wife. But I mean, I, I, it is, there is something wrong with somebody in their late 20s, early 30s or, or older having wives in their in their mid-teens or younger and so that kind of stuff bothered me and that started to say, well, what kind of a man of god would do that you know and that, that that was the first stuff that bugged me and i actually went to my mission president and his wife uh my faith was shaken hard on that and i went and they, and they gave me the church's official position on all these things and they gave me oh well you see elder pratt joseph smith after he died you know a lot of the a lot of the finer points of of temple marriage and 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 uh, plural wife stuff hadn't been figured out and so there were a lot of women who after he died took their daughters teenage daughters to the temple and got them sealed to joseph smith they never consummated a marriage he never had any physical contact with them while they were 15 or 14 or whatever it was and so they sent me away kind of satisfied and then i'd go back into the world and i'd hear something else about joseph smith you know that he used to look through glass stones and look for buried treasure back in 1826 he was indicted for for treasure seeking and i guess uh, josiah stole's nephew who was concerned that Josiah was going to die and not leave him any of his, uh, uh, I guess, uh, inheritance. He felt it was being squandered, chasing after Joseph Smith's, you know, his alleged uh, visions through his glass uh, stones years and years and years before he made an account of how he translated the Book of Mormon using, you know, stones. He was in a different county of New York leading people on treasure hunts, you know, and then people will argue about that. I'm not saying it's a fact or not. Everyone can do their own research. There's plenty of evidence to suggest that that's true. And there's people who will say, well, here's all the reasons that that's just made up. But you know, history is, you could, it's hard to know, but there's good evidence that he was looking through rocks for, for buried gold before he allegedly found golden plates. But these types of things bothered me because if Joseph Smith is a fraud, then the Book of Mormon's a fraud. And then Mormonism's a fraud. So when you attack Joseph Smith, you know, it's not like you're just attacking a finer point of doctrine. You're attacking a foundational, the foundation. So, Right. Yeah. And um, the things that you're talking about are, it's really funny because I kind of had the same experience when I, um, I left a, a small town in Washington, which was not uh, by any means a, a, a Latter-day Saint community. We had a community of Latter-day Saints within um, every other religion that you could think of. But, you know, there were a lot of, um, well, I don't even want to name them, but, but they really were anti, you know, Mormons. So, but we were the, you know, popular kids in school. Um, religion wasn't that big of a deal. It, were, it wasn't like, you know, we're a bunch of dweebs or, or something. We played sports and, and, um, and we were friends with everybody else. And, and a lot of us ended up doing just what everybody else did anyway. So, 
it wasn't that big of a deal. But when I went in the military, oh boy, you know, people didn't know anything about like Mormons except the, for the wives and and the Joseph Smith and and um, and it was always Joe Smith and. And uh, so, you know, so I, I was in the South and very, um, you know, Bible Belt uh, culture at the time. And so, I, you know, when you're in the Army, you don't want to go around being a missionary. You've got training and, you know, you're trying to survive and, and you're doing a lot of very difficult things you don't really want to do. So um, I had the same uh, kind of culture shock. And for me, it was always being poor. Um, I just wanted to get done with the things that I wanted to get done with like school and getting a job and, and all that, that stuff. So I kind of, you know, left it, left it aside and everything. And, um, you know, I, 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 um, I wrote a book about, uh, my experiences being a, a Latter-day Saint. And it also talks about the connections with Joseph Smith, the Freemasons and, uh, and some of the stuff that you're talking about. So I'm going to leave that. And if people are interested in it, and if you're interested in it, my book, Deceptions of the Ages, um, are there. But um, I, I, I've always liked myself. I just like the philosophy. And, uh, you know, you're supposed to do good to other people and stuff. So I, I've been a, away from it enough to, to not be offended by people in the church. Like, I'm, I'm sure you have been. And... Um, Anyway, but but let's talk a little bit about people leave the church for various reasons. And some people just, uh, they just don't go anymore. Um, but Eric, what, what is your degree? Do you, you want, you don't, you want people to understand that this is not uh, something that you should spend your time on? Is that, is that what we're talking about? Well, I'm I, and and to get a little cute, there's a movie called The Matrix, and I think it was made in 1997. That a lot of my generation or younger, maybe a lot of people younger than me, maybe maybe haven't seen, but my generation and and some of the older have seen. Um, the the idea that you know, I remember in that movie, uh, Morpheus wakes up Neo, or he pulls the plug and introduces him into the real world, and he he apologizes. He says, uh, you know, we we have a rule: we don't free a mind after it's a certain age. It doesn't, it just doesn't know how to handle it. And I, I think about this a lot when you say, and as a general rule, do I want people to find another way or to turn away from it? Uh, if they're young enough, I think there's people who have invested their entire lives into this belief system. And it's been the framework for how they've interacted with the, with the world for their entire life. Now they're 60 years old, 70 years old, 80 years old. I wouldn't want to be too helpful in, in, in waking them up. I don't know what would happen. It was a tragedy. What happened to me, at 31 uh, is when I really woke up and my life deconstructed very quickly and in a really whew, kind of a incredibly, it was a disaster. Uh, losing my framework that I built my 31 years of life around to how do I interact with life? What is the meaning of life? Where am I going when I die? What, what, where did I come from? What's the purpose? When that all was pulled out from under me without a guided without someone there to guide me, YouTube, Christopher Hitchens, he's, he's who woke me up. By the time he woke me up, he'd already been dead for years. There was no one to you know, hold my hand and help show me another way. So when, when the framework for my life was obliterated by just stuff that he, that he articulated, because he was very good at articulating in a way that hit home for me. And I realized, wow, I have been living in a dream world. And, and so what do I replace that with? You know, what is my reality? So I used to be afraid. I used to think, well, if this is all false, then what's the point? I didn't realize that, okay, if that's all false, then the point is whatever I make it. The point is, the beauty is now I get to decide what the point is. And some people will listen to me say that and be like, oh my goodness, you know, this is terrible. We can't let people decide for themselves what the point is because people will start raping and murdering and all these, this, this nonsense you hear that without religion... As Christopher Hitchens said quite frequently, we didn't get our morals from religion. Religion got its morals from us. Uh, we wouldn't get where we are as a society if, if certain things were not innate. If evolution had not bred out of the population certain antisocial behaviors, we wouldn't have got where we are. And what makes something uh, a social behavior is something that leads to reproduction and, and uh, so societal um, peace. 
And so what you find over all the millennia of, of, of evolution are, are people who have certain innate qualities. We know it's not a good idea to lie and to perjure and steal and to sleep with your neighbor's wife and to covet their things. We know what kinds of, you know, that, those are antisocial behaviors. They lead to you becoming an outcast of society. And they do not lend themselves to attracting viable mates. Most people are not attracted to the outcast and they wouldn't want to go start a family with an outcast. They want to be part of society. And so that person's DNA will stop when they die because they probably don't get to reproduce. Uh, of course, things are different nowadays with the internet and mass communication. And everything's different. But for, for millennia, that's been the idea. And so to, to say that we get our morals from religion is kind of absurd when you look at it scientifically. It's, 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 abs- it's nonsense. So. Well, I, and I mean, I would, I would just have to say we get, it, it depends on the, on the religion um, from which we uh, – we get our morals. Um, I've spent a lot of time in, in the Middle East, and um, th- they're very religious people, but they live with big walls around them, and they have to wear clothes so people can't see them because they don't want to be raped. And um, so what Christopher Hitchens is saying, um, you know, being a, uh, like I'm, I love history, I studied history in college, is that there's always been this idea of um, – that life was in the ancient world was nasty, brutish, and short. And it sounds like uh, Christopher Hitchens is saying, no, um, it's naturally we're the, it's the noble savage. And um, without uh, organization, uh, everybody's happy. And so I, I, I don't know where, um, I don't know which is true. I mean, I guess it's true for, for whatever you, you want to, uh, to think about it. But I've seen, um, I've, you know, spent uh, 13 years in the Middle East and, um, you know, it's, they're all very religious people, but it's also, um, it, it's not, and, and even the people that live there say it's not safe. So, yeah. so, so, yeah. so uh, that's, that's what I say. But um, I, I, I think that um, for myself and I, I don't want to ever interject my opinions, but um, I've always seen that, that, religion and, and with Muslims and, and, and with Latter-day Saints, it tempers the beast in, in people. Um, and so in that respect, I, I think it's good. And, and, and the, and the, the idea that it, um, you know, for any religion that you, you are working and you're thinking about a higher me, I'm not, you know, I'm not just because I have to get food for today and I've got to, you know, get new tires on the car, but, but there's something bigger and that people need something bigger. So people don't really understand that, that might be listening to this podcast that you took a leap from the Latter-day Saint faith where the, the whole culture, everything, I mean, from what you do in the morning to what you do at night when you go to bed is all dictated by your membership in the church, the things that you know, the things that you watch, uh, the things that are important to you. And then you just left it, you left it all behind. That might drive somebody insane. Well, it, it does because, um, well, I mean, in, in, in it's common to many religions, uh, who you sleep with in what way, what you can eat on what day, um, what, uh, who you associate with, how you dress, um, where you go, where you don't go, your activities are, you know, and it's not just Mormonism, it's a lot of religions, you know, I mean, if you're Muslim, you're supposed to do uh, prayer five, t- five days, uh, five times a day facing you know, Mecca. If you're Jewish, you're not going to use any electronics. If you're Orthodox, you're not using electronics on, the, on Saturday. Um, I mean, we don't have to go through it all. But yes, for me, my particular situation was Mormonism. If I, if I was born in the Middle East, I would probably have been Islamic and I would have had a different set of rules to abide by that would have dictated my day. Um, yeah, everything changed. Uh, and, and, and I didn't go from believing in Mormonism to believing in another religion. Um, I went from believing in Mormonism to, to not believing that religion. I, 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 not to say that if you're happy with your religion, not to sound like Obama, if you're happy with your religion, you can keep it. But uh, if your religion serves you, who am I to, why, what interest do I have in trying to pry someone away from something that serves them? Do I believe in it? No, of course not. Um, if you're a religious person of a particular denomination, you probably doubt the, the, the validity of every other religion except for your own. Most religions do, otherwise they would be part of that other religion. They'd be together. If they had the same doctrines and beliefs, why separate? So I take it one church further and just say I don't believe in any of them as far as them being from a, a God, an, an intervening God who has given, uh, you know, 
structure to society on how to interact and, and how to worship him. I, I don't believe in any of it, but to speak to Mormonism in particular, I did lose my framework and I lost any, I, I don't have any, any interest in any other religious, religious framework. And so I had to find my own way. And to, to, to my delight, as soon as I renounced Mormonism, I didn't find the temptation to murder anyone or rape anyone or steal from anyone or lie to anyone any more enticing. And so I don't know what to say. Some people say, well, you know, Eric, you were, you were born uh, in America, and so you were raised with Judeo-Christian values, and they've been instilled in you from birth, and so that's why you were that way. I don't believe that. I, I don't, but I guess either way, I, it, nothing happened as far as, like, my morality. I just had – what happened – I'll tell you what happened. I came to a place where I find that my morals and ethics are in line with most Christian churches, not because I'm Judeo-Christian, but because most Christian churches say – don't kill. I mean, the Ten Commandments, uh, if you exclude the first four, which are just particularly how you're supposed to interact with God, just the other six, you know, don't lie, don't covet, don't commit adultery, don't, you know, don't murder. Yeah, those, I don't want to ever want to do those things anyway. I mean, yeah, we all lie here and there, I guess, but I think I've been much more honest since I've been able to throw off my religion. I felt like I had to do quite a lot of lying to myself and others to keep up with society's echo chamber I was living in. And so I feel more honest now than ever. Um, all that being said, I had to find my own framework, and it's not rooted in, in a particular religion. Some will say, well, it's rooted in Judeo-Christian values that you're raising. This. Yes, okay, fine, I don't mind, whatever. I still think if I were Jewish, or excuse me, Islamic, and I left Islam, I, and I was not raised in a Judeo-Christian country, there's plenty of Islamic people. Look at uh, Ayan Hirsi Ali. She was not raised in a Judeo-Christian environment, and yet my morals and my ethics match hers. She was not and I was raised in a Judeo-Christian uh, country, and she wasn't. What do you know? We have the same, we have the same morals, and, and we got there on our own. And so what we did is, and I don't know about her, but what I did was, as I started to interact with the, with the world without the church as my guide, what happened was I started to see that, hey, you know, you touch a hot stove, you get burned. It doesn't matter if God says it or if God doesn't exist. If you touch the hot stove, you will get burned. It's the same. It's, so you can. some people say, well, that's just an eternal truth. Fine. Did it come from God? Does it not come from God? doesn't matter. My ethics and morals have found themselves to be the same as most Christian people. Um, and I just got there through logic, reasoning, life experience, just metacognition, pro-social behaviors that benefit myself and my society and my family and people around me and, and eschewing antisocial behaviors that hurt me and my society and my family and people around me. And I don't feel like I need a supernatural deity to, to supervise those rules. They just, they are if that makes sense. Wow. What a great podcast. You don't want to miss part two. So go to wherever you're listening to this podcast and just click on part two of the Eric Pratt interview. Or if you're on YouTube, just go to the second part of the interview by clicking any of the links at the end of the video. Boy, it's amazing, isn't it? All right, well, let's go get to part two without wasting any more time. This has been Books in Hindsight with your host, Matthew Hines. Please join us for our next podcast and look for our archives on iTunes and go to thehindsight.com. That's H-E-I-N-E-S site.com for great books by Matthew Hines and other great authors.